been a long time, everyone, but it's time to record a new King of Our Nightmares. This episode, we're talking about the Kubrick classic that is the most overrated film ever, but we're actually talking about Stephen King's novel, his third novel, The Shining. And, and what an appropriate time. Yes. I have a couple covers I want to show you for the video people. Let me go grab them. Because I forgot. I bought an original book club edition of The Shining what? for this. And then lost it. And then we didn't record. We were supposed to record the sh- this episode like four months ago. And it didn't happen. So let me go grab that real fast. All and, right. Uh, yeah, this is this is good. This is good podcast material, right? Yeah, here. let me let me grab my copy so I can also show something off. <laughs> Julia, we just have an ad break right here. All right, there we go. Ah. All right, I'm back. Jeremy is not. Oh, Lord, here we go. So I have two different copies of The Shining. The first is this, of course, three-book set that has Carrie and Salem's Lot in it as well. This is the with Barnes a, Noble exclusive. With a shining cover. Yes. When you read the book, you realize. And then Carrie Blood Bucket. And then nothing about Salem's Lot. Well, it's an S. It's also for Stephen King. Yeah. And then I got this cover. This is one of the worst Stephen King covers I've seen for America. It's is that the original a, one, right? It's the original. Is that a chow? Or is that a lion? Mm-hmm. How Why is there a good, it's just Danny looks terrible. Like it's just it's just He looks like a zombie. He does. It's just bad. It's just a bad cover, but it's so vintagey, and these are expensive. Mm-hmm. So um, mine are a little more simplistic. I mean, at least that one, it's bad, but it's a like a drawing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? This one. Oh, and because we do this every episode, the German titles. German title, it's not The Shining. It's just Shining. Okay. Very complicated. I think... Uh, this one is like the actual hotel that King wrote about, you know, where he stayed in when he got the inspiration. I think that's oh. really this one. <laughs> and then I have this completely orange one. Ugh, why does it look like a pumpkin? I don't know. Um, but yeah, let's get into The Shining. The Shining is a... Rather than have an entire town story again, Stephen King gives us three really flushed out characters, and they're the Torrances. We got Jack Torrance, who is a disgraced college, not not college, he's a prep school professor. Um, he He's trying to write a play to redeem himself because of something that happened at the prep school, and his He's a recovering alcoholic. Recovering like alcoholic King. writer. Um, Much like Stephen King. <clears throat> we got his wife, Wendy Torrance, who has mom issues. Has a whole bunch of problems, and she's pretty kind of dependent on Jack for at least the first half of this. Uh, and then we got Danny, and Danny has The Shining which is like a psychic power. He can see the future. He can see dead people like the kid in the sixth sense. And they're going to be staying at the Overlook Hotel during its off season. Uh, Jack is the caretaker. 
It's going to give him the perfect time to write his play. But little do we know, the place is haunted and really haunted and evil. Also, I I need to not forget a character who I am forgetting. Forgetting his name, the cook. Is it oh, um, um, it's not Callahan. It's not Callahan. Why am I forgetting? Oh Jesus! How okay, now you got this. Yeah, Halloran, Dick Halloran, 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 Dick Halloran, who also has a bit of The Shining too, and he is kind of a little bit Danny's mentor. You like it. He's a really likable character immediately. Mm-hmm. Well, they're all kind of likable at first. Yeah. And then Jack goes insane, which is something that both film adapt both the film adaptation and the miniseries don't quite get. Like Jack is he's a He's kind of, I guess, the protagonist of this. Oh, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, and it's just him falling apart. Because I think a a misconception is this is about Danny. Oh, it isn't. Well, not really. Not really. I think that that more has to do with Dr. Sleep. Oh, yeah, where he became the actual main character in the sequel. But in this one, it's very much about all three characters, the entire family. Yes, Yes. and Stephen King does a fantastic job of flushing it out. Because this is something, if I have one complaint about Salem's Lot, after reading The Shining, it's that a lot of the characters that are brought up in Salem's Lot, they don't have a lot to do. Yeah, They're there to make this story big and impactful and, like, when they get turned into vampires, you don't care so much about some of them. Others you do. But like with this, he dials it back for the spooky. And there's which a lot is, of... Which is also something I really like, how different his first three novels are. Yes. Like Harry was about basically just one, this one outsider girl and these other kids in high school, was it, right? Yes. Then Salem's Lot, okay, let's take a look at an entire city. You know, Salem's Lot. And this is just, okay, we have this one family. Let's explore them. And I like mm-hmm. these different approaches, yes. There are certain things, there are certain stories that I, I get a cold feeling. Like when you're reading it, it's just like you can feel that it's winter, that you're trapped. And The Shining's one of those where oh, yeah. the movies don't quite, for me, the Kubrick one does a little bit with the, the trapped feeling. Mm-hmm. If I do have a positive about the Kubrick film, it is that. Um, Oh, Lord. We're already talking about it. But Stanley Kubrick adapted The Shining into a movie that everyone likes except for Noah and me. Yeah. Um, In fact, I hate it. I think it's one of the most overrated films ever i don't think it's good i don't think it's well acted it's just people love kubrick and so they'll love anything he does except for ai Hmm. they don't love that and they don't love eyes wide shut yeah you know shut is a better movie but not Hmm. by much you know i don't hate kubrick's shining movie i don't i don't hate it but i don't like it it's, it's a terrible adaptation. As Yeah, as an adaptation, it definitely fails on pretty much every level. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest thing, which I think we talked about before, is Jack Torrance's character and his yes. character arc that he has in the book, which is pretty much completely absent from the movie. Yeah, he's awful pretty much the whole time. Yeah, and I mean, so not Jack as like... Nicholson. He's yeah, just so he's Jack, Jack Nicholson, Nicholson playing Jack Nicholson like he does in most films. Yeah, which is he's not even like a horrible person necessarily at the beginning of the movie, but, but just from the way he talks and interacts with people, you immediately get the feeling, okay, this guy is an asshole. Yeah. Which is something with Jack in this book, 
you get the feeling he can be an asshole, but we get so much from his point of view and he hates himself more than yes. anything. And he really tries to be better and you mm -hmm. do feel for him, which makes his, you know, going insane more tragic. Yeah. And it also, it freaks Danny out because Jack kind of has a little of the shining. It's implied. It's implied, but he doesn't have enough of it to understand that he has the shining. And that's part of his downfall. That and his alcoholism, which is what the, the ghosts play to. Mm -hmm. Which I don't think the Kubrick movie touched on his alcoholism, right? Uh, a little bit it does. Yeah, I know, like in the bar scene. The bar scene. Famous, with... But before that, not really. Whereas the book really goes in detail, obviously. Oh, yeah, it can, because there's a lot of flashbacks in the book. Yeah. One it's of my favorites bad. is his uh, realization when he has gone too far, because he has, like, one of his colleagues, his friends, he goes to a bar with him, gets drunk, and then they drive home, and mm -hmm. they drive over like a bicycle. Yeah, and they think they and hit they, a kid. Yeah, and they freak out because they think they just hit a kid and they don't find a, a body or anything. But... Mm -hmm. It shocked them so much. Both decide, okay, we're going to stop with alcohol. Like, this has gone too far. Yeah. And obviously, there's something that comes back with Dr. Sleep. And King has talked about this. Shining is Jack Torrance tries to get sober, like, on his own. And Dr. Sleep is Danny trying to get sober, like, with Alcoholics Anonymous, whatever. Yes. Trying to get professional help. Yes. Which... I, I'm going to, we're going to end up talking about Dr. Sleep a little bit in this, but I don't want to talk about all of Dr. Sleep. Yeah, we just have to bring it up because obviously it ties in. The, well, there's a hand, there's some things I want to discuss with Dr. Mm -hmm. Sleep. One of them, I want to talk about Danny's shining ability. All right. But, but first, so, so one of the big things that's a big rift in, Jack and Wendy's marriage is that when Danny was a little, little kid, because Danny's a little kid in this, but when he was younger, when he was like three, he spilled Jack's beer all over his a script he was working on. And Jack broke Danny's arm. And so there's a bunch of problems with that. There's problems with Jack's alcoholism. And that's kind of has a, a rocky marriage thing going on with this. Um, but Which is interesting because that plot point comes directly from Stephen King, which he mentioned once. His kid, I think it was Joe, also like literally did this, like ruined one of his scripts. Mm -hmm. And King, he didn't beat his kid up, but he was like, wow, in this moment, I'm so filled with rage, I would like to beat my kid up. Mm -hmm. And then he obviously this lead into this book yes With, so uh, I, so this just shows you more why he doesn't like kubrick's shining mm -hmm. probably because he has there's so much of himself in jack torrance yes it's like what stephen king could have become if he succumbed to his alcoholism completely um but danny danny picks up on all this and doesn't understand it he picks up on Jack wants to kill himself. He wants. He picks up that there was a baby, which I wanted to talk about because in the book it's explained a way that Wendy and Jack wanted a second child. Yeah, but th could this have been Abra's mother? Ooh, you want to okay, tie this so I gotta explain sleep. something here. Spoilers to Doctor Sleep. It's been out for like a decade now. The main uh, there's a little girl in it named Abra, and Abra and Danny are connected. They both have Tony, which we haven't even talked about Tony yet. But Tony is Danny's imaginary friend, kind of, who comes to him when The Shining happens. Um. But um, the reason they're connected is due to the fact that 
Jack had an affair while yeah. either in college or while they were at when he was teaching at the prep school. He fathered a child with this woman. The woman died in like I was like hit by a car or something, but her daughter ends up being raised by her grandmother, and then Abra is the great grandchild. So it's like Danny's Abra's Danny's half niece. Yeah, they are uncle it's, and niece. But can I can honestly say that like you could interpret it as there was a Danny like realized that that happened and didn't comprehend. Hmm. Because I remember when I initially read Doctor Sleep, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. That's that's one of my least favorite points in Doctor Sleep, is this it's like a soap opera cliche. Yeah. Which they <laughs> cut out of the movie Doctor Sleep. But probably I haven't watched it, but the Abra in that in the movie is black, so most likely. That yeah. <clears throat> Although I, I as I recall, she's Hispanic. Or is she? I, I don't know. Hispanic in the in book. The book. Um, because isn't her mother, her grandmother, Hispanic or great grandmother? I should say. It's been too long. I don't remember exactly. I can't remember either. I read it like two years ago. But yeah, um, we got Tony. So t- Tony was, um, was, oh God, Danny's imaginary friend. Yes, and he looks like an older Danny, which well, was, we don't know that at first. At first, it's more like a revelation later on. Yeah, as is his name Tony, uh, because Danny's name is Daniel Anthony uh, Torrance. Yes, um. But he's, he keeps showing him visions of don't go to the Overlook. But Danny has to because his parents go there, and then we have all the crazy things that like start happening there. Mm-hmm. Room thirteen with the dead woman in the tub. Oh, uh, which is different in the book. It's room twenty thirty seven, and in the movie, I think it's. 217, right? I can't like they, ch- they, ch- they changed the number for some reason. Yeah, I think so, but I don't I don't remember. There's the fire hose. Yeah, which we can say that works in the book. It, it doesn't work, work in the miniseries. No. It looks horrible. Nothing to the, the miniseries. You know, the, the the animals. Oh yeah, that's that's the worst. That's what everyone, if they've seen the miniseries, remembers. Is the is the awful CGI. Yeah. And the fact that it has no... It's not scary. It's a literal adaptation, and it just doesn't translate to film. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. 90% of Stephen King's work is unfilmable, especially when it comes to the horror Oh, definitely. Like, when you try to do it, like, literal, like, my thing with the Kubrick movie is, visually, I personally don't have too much of a problem, and I can understand why he changed certain things and Uh make them, to make them more scary. Okay, that's fine. Like we said, he changed the animals to, what was it? The labyrinth. Yeah, the maze. Okay, that's fine. Understandable. But then it failed when it came to the characters. Uh And bad acting. There's some yeah. really over the top acting. The kid who plays Danny is wasn't an actor. Guy. Yeah, he wasn't an actor. Also, Tony is his finger for some reason. For some fucking reason, that's so bizarre. I can understand that you need to have like a visual, like mm-hmm. you can't have like an like imagine like a Star Wars Jedi ghost. That would have been ridiculous. No, but. but- I like how it's handled in Doctor Sleep, the movie. How is it handled? I haven't seen it. Um, it's it's a lot like the book. 
a lot of but it's crazy cg visuals mm. it's just now that kind of looks fine oh, i mean it, it it's not a no time to die level of cg mm-hmm. But like, there's all sorts of stuff with like filing cabinets and things in that, as I recall. I've only seen it once, so, and that was like when it came out on Blu-ray, because I own it. I've just watched it the one time. Um, it's weird. It's a weird. That's a weird adaptation that we'll talk about when we review Doctor Sleep in ten years. Yeah, because it's both a sequel to the book and the movie. Which are yes. extremely different. Yes, because there's a whole thing in the Overlook in the movie. And we have the kid who was in E.T. playing Jack Nicholson. <laughs> it's bizarre. And they make him kind of look like Jack Nicholson. And it's just, it's weird. I'm glad they didn't do what Disney does with the motion capture. Oh, yeah, when they CGI it. Yeah. Which looks heinous. But yeah, anyway. Um, there's just creepy, creepy things. And I don't want to reveal too much about the horror in this book. Because I want people to experience it. Whereas in Salem's Lot, we literally did a deep dive analysis into things. But like, I pretty much we've said the things that people know about the book i don't want to spoil more although i will say the the masquerade stuff in the book is really well done Mm -hmm. when things really go crazy yeah especially when when dick halloran's reintroduced and he has to like rescue oh yeah that's a great element when he comes back which in the movie again The naked woman on his wall? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay, that was fine, but... That that made me laugh when I first saw it. I'm like, why? Why does he have a giant, like, poster-sized naked woman on his wall? And they were just zooming in, because I saw it on TV originally. It was, like, the first time AMC got the rights to, like, show it. And they just have this big old blur over her boobs. <laughs> And it's just this zooming in, and I'm just like, I was freaking laughing because it's just so weird. I mean, at the time, I had no idea who Stanley Kubrick was. And I didn't know this was like considered a great movie because my mom hates this movie. Mm. Absolutely. She's like, ugh, you're watching The Shining and like left the room. She does that with most things. Like, oh, you're watching Death Wish 3 again? (laughs) Just leaves. That's great. But yeah, with Halloran's character. I mean, I like the actor who portrays him. In oh yeah, movie. no, he's the best. Yeah. But I, d- I don't really get the decision to kill him off. I oh, guess. yeah. Yeah, I, don't I know. Don't. It's, it's kind it, of a waste. It's a shocking scene when it happens in the movie. Yeah. Um, it's, it may be the most shocking thing besides that dog giving that dude head. Hmm. Oh no, you know what was the most shocking thing in the movie? The cameo by the original James Bond. Barry Nelson plays Ullman, the the hotel manager. So Casino Royale and The Shining are connected. (laughs) We have have a James Bond reference here. I hate it. But yeah, (laughs) um... Things get really, really crazy in this book, and the ending is a lot different from the movie, and I don't want to spoil it for people. Yeah, just to say, Stephen King, I think, put it this way in his afterword for Dr. Sleep, Kubrick's movie is ice, and his book is fire, Mm -hmm. to reference the elements, like Mark Foster would do. And and the, the classic movie, Quantum of Solace. Yes. The greatest Bond film ever made. Indeed, cinematic masterpiece. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I this is a, like I think of The Shining as the perfect Stephen King book. Hmm. I mean, most of the elements are in there, definitely. Yes, 
it's not too overly sexual. There's some sexual things in there, mm-hmm. weird sexual things, but they're not. When we get into '80s Stephen King, that yeah, I would cranked up. I would say this is appropriately sexually weird. Yes, and I mean we got the alcoholic, mm-hmm. the author, mm-hmm. uh, the supernatural element, the child with supernatural powers. What else did we we got a family drama and all the good character stuff? Yes. Which begs the question: Did he perfect it with this book? Like, did he get better and better with his first three novels? Yes, this is definitely a progression. I think with Salem's Lot, he bit more off than he could chew at times. So when he dialed it back and just worked on a handful of characters, it was far better. Hmm. Which we also have some short stories that go along with this that I've never read. I haven't read them either, but they are available online. So it's before the play. That's the one that's mostly recommended by people because that's actually new stuff. It's about the history of the Overlook Hotel. Apparently it's very interesting. It's similar to like what we get in the book when Jack finds this map... uh, not map this book um, with the history and all these uh, news articles about what happened thing that starts happening when he becomes obsessed with the hotel. Exactly. And I think the short story is like made up of such articles and stuff, like really exploring all of the history of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And then there's also after the play, which is like an epilogue to this book, which I think was only reprinted once uh, by Cemetery Dance in like their really expensive um, reprinting of the of the novel, hmm. but apparently it's not really good and doesn't have much extra stuff in it. It's just uh, it's not like the epilogue to Salem's Lot that we'll be reading next time. Well, actually, no, no, we won't okay. be reading it next time. We have. We have a deep dive into some weird Stephen King next time. Do we? Isn't Night Shift next time? No. Rage. Oh, that's right. We, we, we shift into Bachman. Into one of the hardest things I've ever had to read. I'm still not done with it. <laughs> I finished it in like a day. It's really short. I know, but it's... You also don't live in America. Yeah. It feels different here. Um, but yeah, what would you rate The Shining? Ooh. Did I even rate the previous books? Like I in wanna just, I want to just start rating these. Okay, okay. Um, out of 10, I would say this is a solid ooh, 8 or 9. It's really, really strong. My only complaint would be, while the family drama stuff is all good, it's somewhat like slow and redundant at times. Yeah, it gets it has a very slow build before things get super crazy. Yeah, which is not really a problem since we got a lot of good character stuff mm-hmm. in these slower moments and the build up. But again, it can drag on a little bit. Yes, but um, otherwise, I, I would say this is solid. I think it's a perfect book. I give it a ten out of ten. Ooh, I, I, this is like if you're going to read a Stephen King book and you want to read it, I say no. Maybe you should start with The Shining before you dive into that insanity. Yeah, I, I mean, Shining is shorter. I can't tell you how many people I know have jumped into it and been like, "Why do you like Stephen King?" <laughs> it's like. You're reading Co- Stephen King on cocaine right now. I, I just realized, like, in the context of King, <sighs> it is like a celebration of excess. Yes. And it you might be a start with... 80s book. Ooh, I don't know. I think there are books of his from the 80s that, are, that have aged worse, where you can tell those are definitely 80s books. With it, it's a little bit different i would say 
Well, yeah, there's the stuff with the kids in like the 50s. Yeah, because when I think it, I mostly think of it as a 50s book. I guess it's a very because, twisted one. Yeah, because those parts with the kids in the 50s are the strongest parts, which we can also talk about with Shining. I don't really get like a 70s vibe from this book. No, it feels timeless. There's a few dated like technology things. And you yeah. just find that in any sort of book like this. But that's the thing with most of his books from the 70s. They're sort of timeless. Yeah. Like I said, they, t- they all tackle like different things. These, the yeah. outsider in school, these, this entire village, family drama. Next, and we they, have the crazy child. That sh- a, which so also old. never gets old. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, none of these kids get old. Unfortunately, it's more realistic now. But yeah, we're going to be talking... Next time, we're going to be talking Rage, the first Bachman book, which we're going to probably end up talking more about the whole Richard Bachman thing than the book itself. (laughs) But yeah, anyway, if you can find a copy of Rage, good luck. Yeah, King, King shut it down. Yeah, it's the only book that he won't have reprinted. For all my German friends out here, you can find it easily. Yeah. Like I bought my copy for like two two euros. It's it's easy. I have the only hardcover copy. I can find that must have been expensive. Ye- Ooh, I got a good deal. I paid forty because mm. it also has Rage Running Man, as Rage Running Man Road Work, and the Long Walk. Oh yeah, the Bachman books. Yeah, the Bachman four. Uh, the only it's only missing a handful of other Bachman stuff that came out later when he occasionally would write a Bachman thing which we'll get into that's gonna be fun this has been King of Our Nightmares sorry it took so long but we're gonna start trying to get these up onto uh, podcast streaming platforms so that's the goal anyway have a good day join us for Live and Let's Discuss that's happening in 30 minutes Later. Bye-bye.